So, Michael, how do we think about free will and, and individual responsibility? Well, it's a big topic, and it begins in antiquity, but thankfully for neuroscience, um, it begins about 30 years ago with some experiments by Benjamin Libet. Libet, um, maybe we could have the, the, the video. Libet did a very, very simple experiment. He had his subjects sit, he told them to relax, look at a clock, and whenever they were ready, they should move their hands. That's it. Now, he asked the subjects to note the time on the clock at the time when they first felt this urge to move. Okay? And all the while he's measuring activity from the brain, that's what you see in the, in the monitor there, that's called a, a readiness potential, it's recorded like an EEG from the head. And uh, Libet discovered a couple things. He, f he found that the people, not surprisingly, reported that their urge to move occurred before they actually moved. Um, and, um, and he uh, also confirmed the existence of this readiness potential, this activity in the brain that precedes a movement. No big surprise there. But the surprising finding was that um, the same potential, the same readiness potential, occurred about a second before the subject had any subjective awareness of their own intention to move. And some people find that very disturbing. They find it disturbing because it seems to imply, to at least to some, that the will to move was just an illusion. It's just this thing caused by the brain. Um, I have to say that from my point of view, I'd be more disturbed if the will to move wasn't caused by the brain. Okay? So, so you see, to a neuroscientist, neuroscientists aren't at all surprised that there are, there's activity in the brain that would precede a movement, and I don't think we should be terribly surprised that there's activity in the brain that precedes an idea to move. And the same kind of logic applies to a responsibility for a decision. The brain causes us to make decisions. But that doesn't mean we're not responsible for them. I mean, the brain causes us to do everything, after all. For example, when an artist um, makes something novel and wonderful, okay, it was the brain of the artist that made her do it. And, you know, when we explain the machinery of the brain, we don't explain away creativity, and we don't explain away choice, volition, and uh, responsibility. I think we have to be much more refined in our thinking. Now, what the Libet experiment does that's really wonderful, really, I, as I see it, his legacy is he got the ball rolling and he said, look, you can measure events in the brain that are uh, responsible for mental states like volition, like the urge to move. And that's interesting. And in, in the last 20 years, we've seen this, really, this enormous explosion of what Danny was referring to as decision neuroscience. And it's now routine in many labs around the world to record activity from even single neurons in the brain, single nerve cells, that are involved in deliberation and planning and probabilistic reasoning and even assigning confidence to decisions. And I think um, that those, the insights from those kinds of experiments, they are providing kind of a new angle on some of the building blocks of cognitive science, what we were discussing a moment ago. And I think they, bear, they have some bearing on responsibility, the kinds of things that Alan is uh, thinking about in, the, in courts of law and in society. And um, let me try to explain uh, what I mean by that. Just, I'll just give you one example of a finding from neuroscience, that we're beginning to understand how the brain trades off the speed of a decision against the accuracy. So for example, Eric and I might be observing the same facts, but we might reach different decisions because I might be pretty quick and Eric might be slower and more deliberative. Now, Eric may make the better decision. I mm. think that's probably correct in I general. I doubt that, but go <laughs> on. I like it. And, and the idea is, now we're understanding the speed accuracy trade-off at the level of neural mechanism, okay? But it's bearing on what makes one decision maker different than another. One may be more impulsive or more methodical or perhaps paralyzed by indecisiveness. And, and it's at the level that, this is at the level of neural mechanism that we can begin to get a handle on that. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that, um, that we can say with the neurons what someone's going to do. It doesn't mean that we can say, using neurophysiology, whether someone has lied or told the truth. We can't tell whether someone's guilty or innocent, and we can't tell societies how they should balance, you know, pu punishment or punitive methods versus rehabilitative methods in, in the criminal justice system. But what I think we can do, especially in the setting of disease, is have some insight to some mitigating insight about the degree of culpability, say, or um, 
um, uh, maybe be able to form prognoses about the possibility of rehabilitation or predict the probability of recidivism. And this is the role, as I see it, of neuroscience of decision-making um, in both in society and in, and in the 